you have a Bible, please open it to Acts chapter 11. It's in Pew Bible page. Somebody shout it out. What page is it? Shout it from the mountaintops. There you go. Acts chapter 11, verses 19 to 26. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Do you see anything going on in the church at Antioch that you want at Calvary? Did you hear anything happening that the God was doing and you're like, hey Lord, do that here. We want that. I do. I see a vitally healthy church. There's racial reconciliation. People are being drawn to Jesus. Hearts, homes, lives are being transformed. There is joy, there's peace, there's faith, there's love, there's worship where it never existed before in this city. There's something going on in Antioch that we're like, Lord Jesus, would you please do that here? So no wonder when, when uh, Barnabas comes and he reports on it, Luke says, he saw the grace of God. You usually think of the grace of God as being something invisible, right? Something the Spirit ministers to. You can't see it, but you sure know it. Here, it's so palpable that Barnabas sees it. Wow! God's grace is exploding. Now, humanly, the reason for that is there's preaching and teaching. Men and women, presumably, are sharing the good news of the gospel. From a divine point of view, the reason it's being blessed is what? It's this wonderful phrase in verse 21, and the hand of the Lord was upon them. Where God's hand is, apparently exciting, gracious, life-changing things begin to happen. And when I began to pray about this particular sermon, that's what the Lord put on my heart that you're to know the hand of the Lord has been upon you in the history of this church through Rick and Beth Ann's ministry through your worship, your giving, your serving, your faithfulness the hand of the Lord has been upon Calvary and when we think about the next decades in her life what do we want? We want the hand of the Lord to be on this church. So I want to ask two simple questions. Number one, what is that? What's the hand of the Lord? What does it mean? Why is it desirable? Secondly, I want to ask, what are some implications for you and me when the hand of the Lord is upon our church? Okay, so we're just going to focus uh, on this one phrase, and I want to acknowledge this text is rich. It's like a garden with a plethora of beautiful flowers. A variety of lovely blossoms. There's many flowers in this text. I'm only picking one for us to look at. Just one. This phrase, 
the hand of the Lord was upon them. I mean, that's the, that is the originating cause why people are being converted, why the grace of God is palpable, why there's rec re racial reconciliation, why, there's, why this, the third largest city in the Roman Empire, it becomes the staging center for world missions. Antioch does. There's a, a seismic shift away from Jerusalem. I mean, it's right, the theological capital of the universe. It is now shifting to this city. There's an amazing shift in the program of God because from a divine point of view, the hand of God is upon it. So let's look, first of all, what is the hand of the Lord? It's a, what theologians call an anthropomorphism. It's a human way of speaking about what God does. And it's a metaphor for the presence of God, for, for, for the work of God on the earth. And when you understand what it means, you would never trade it for anything. So the, this phrase, the, the hand of the Lord, it's used scores of times in the Bible. You, you, you don't have enough time to study it in a concordance. But if you distilled it, as I've done for you this morning, it means at least five aspects of the activity of God on the earth. It stands for God's presence, His power, His protection, his providence, and his provision. Imagine how happy that is for a preacher. They all begin with P. <laughs> so what, is, what does it mean, the hand of the Lord? It stands for his presence. So just like you, where the Lord is, his hand is. It's his presence. When Asaph in Psalm 80 wanted to communicate the presence of God with his son, he says, let, let your hand be on the man of your right hand. Let your hand be on him. God's going to be present with his son. In our text, Jesus is present. He's, he's opened his hand and he's pouring out grace, transforming grace. And um, you know, most of the time we think of the presence of the Lord being very positive. Some of you may be experiencing the hand of the Lord in your life in a chastising kind of way. David says in Psalm 38 when he is feeling numb from sin, he said, your hand was heavy upon me. Now that might sound bad, but it's actually good. If the, if the Lord's hand has to be heavy upon you, it's because he loves you so much to pressure you into repenting and fleeing back to finding life in him. In fact, later on, in Acts 13, there was this shifty guy who wanted to make money from signing the Holy Spirit, Elimus the magician. And it said the Lord, the hand of the Lord was upon him and made him blind. So most of the time, very positive. Some of the time, it's not good news. Secondly, what does the hand of the Lord mean? It refers to not just God's presence, but his power. His power. His power to create, Isaiah 66. My hand made all these things. God's power to save. When, when, when the Bible talks about the Exodus, it's, it's always the hand of the Lord brought them out from captivity. God's power to create, God's power to save, and God's power to heal. So that when the, the disciples are praying to, to Jesus in Acts 4, they're praying that he might stretch out his hand to heal. Translated, let your power come and restore the lives of people, okay? So God's hand refers to his presence, it refers to his power, it refers to his protection. David is, you know, he's, he's a man of war, he's constantly going to war, he's constantly praying for, for God's protection, be a shield about me, be my sanctuary, hide me in the rock, and so in Psalm 18 he says, your right hand upholds me. And guess what? When the right hand of God upholds David, he's safe. Same for you and me. His presence, his power, his protection. Think of the image Jesus gives you to assure you that your sin can never outrun his salvation. John 10, verse 28, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Hmm? 
kind of all three together, the presence, the, the power, and the protection of Jesus. So it's no wonder, thinking about those three, those three things, his presence, his power, and his protect, protection, what's the last symbolic gesture Jesus does in Luke 24 as he's being lifted off the earth and he's saying farewell as it was to his disciples? What does he do? It says he lifted up his hands to bless them, saying, I'm with you, lo, I'm with you always even to the end of the age. My power's with you, I will protect you. Okay, so what are we doing? We are saying that as a church, among other things, we want the hand of God among us. And we're understanding what that is. And we're saying it's a metaphor for, the, for God's, God's working on the earth and it stands for his presence, his power, his protection. Fourthly, it refers to his providence, his leading, his guiding. When the kids were little, we went to the seashore, one of the treasures at the seashore is finding sand dollars, right? They're really rare, they're special to have. If, if you're a beachcomber, sand dollars, the cat's meow of beachcombing. <laughs> so the kids are little and we're walking along the shoreline where you find them and we take them by the hand. And because my vantage point is before, I can see before my kids, it's literally what providence is, pro video, you see before, God sees before and brings to pass all things. Because I can see before my kids, I see a sand dollar up there and I lead them to it so they can have the joy of discovering it for themselves. Well, I'm responsible for the discovery, thank you very much. <laughs> but I'm a parent, I want them to have the joy of feeling like, Daddy, I found a sand dollar. My hand led my child to the sand dollar. God's hand is leading you all the time. He has a plan for your life. He's numbered your days. His hand is leading. It's guiding. That's why we, that's why we sing that hymn. He leadeth me. He leadeth me by his own hand. He leadeth me. That means, beloved, you can trust him. You can rest, and you need to wait. There's a marvelous verse we're going to look at later in the year from 1 Peter chapter 5, where Peter says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. The mighty hand of God. In other words, God's in control. Wait on him. What we want to do is we want to get out here and do life here. And when we feel like it, when it's time to go to church, we kind of move back under here. Or when we're really in bad trouble, we move under here. No, 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 no. Live under the mighty hand of God. Humble yourself. That's the safest place in the universe to be. God bringing us joy as we trust in the unfolding of his plan for our lives and his providence, his hand is guiding us. The fifth one. So his presence, his power, his protection, his providence. Finally, the, the hand of God, among other things, refers to his provision. One of my favorite verses is from Psalm 145. It's a Psalm of David. It's basically a meditation on the goodness of God. It's David's extolling God for his providential care for his whole creation. And in the midst of the Psalm, David says, the Lord opens his hand and satisfies the desire of every living thing. Maybe you don't believe in God. Maybe you were here today, someone brought you, or you've just come to be with us from curiosity. You don't consider yourself a Christian. We're absolutely delighted you're here. Please keep coming. God is saying something to you about himself in this verse. God is saying to all of us that if we've enjoyed anything in life, if we've found satisfaction with anything, if there's anything good from breath to the beating of our hearts to the enjoyment of art and music with the enjoyment of food and drink and sex or friendship or education or the mind, whatever, whatever you have found good in your life, God's given it. It's all because of his grace. He opened his hand and satisfies the desire of every living thing. So if you don't consider yourself a believer in God, God wants you to know something about him. He is irrepressibly generous. He's immeasurably good. And so maybe think about things in your life. We know there's bad things. We know there's good things. Think about how God might be drawing you into a relationship with himself 
by asking you to reflect on good things that you've enjoyed, things that have brought you satisfaction. Okay? What's the hand of God? God working on the earth, ex expressing his presence, his power, his provision, his providence. And there's one other P I'm forgetting, but don't worry about it. We have to stop right here. Because there's a problem, isn't there? If you have read about the God of the Bible, you know that not only is his hand immeasurably generous, it is also otherworldly holy. The hand of God is holy. And actually, anyone who's ever done anything wrong at all, ever, can't take anything out of God's hand. The cost is too high. God's holy. He's righteous. And, and we, we call ourselves sinners. We don't have a right to just take out of the hand of a holy God. And so when we see the phrase, the hand of the Lord was among them, we, and we study what it means in Scripture, we realize that there's a whole new meaning cast on this phrase when you see the cross of Jesus. Because at the cross of Jesus, the hand of God became an instrument of striking judgment. The hand of God that had cradled, as it were, that had hugged, as it were, that had enjoyed fellowship with his son forever and ever became, on Good Friday, on the cross, a hand of unspeakable wrath. That same hand. The reason for that was to pay the price necessary for sinners to take blessings from the hand of God, not least forgiveness, cleansing, reconciliation, and eternal life. Hmm? The cross tells us that the hand of the Lord became an instrument of judgment. Do your sins that has fallen on Jesus. Now let's think about Jesus' hands. His hands were, you know, the Midas touch, everything you touch turns to gold. Jesus' hands were the Zoe touch. Zoe is the Greek word for, for um, life, not biological life, but, but spiritual life. Everything Jesus touched turned to life. He, his hand was irrepressibly filled with life, so he touched the leper, the skin became perfect. He touched the eyes of the blind, they were restored to sight. He touched the hand of the dead, they came to life. His hand said no to the wind and the sea, and it stopped. His hand took bread, what was it, five or seven loaves, broke them, and multiplied for 5,000 people to be fed. The hand of Jesus is a hand of life. And yet, at the cross, it was pierced through and eventually bled and died. The hand of Jesus. The hand that had been filled with everything, right? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He had everything and yet he gave up everything and became nothing to give you everything from the hand of God. It is the hand of Jesus that makes us right with God that saves us, that heals us. By his wounds we are healed. John read it earlier. By his hands you have been saved, right? That's where the nails went. That's where your sin has been placed. So think about your hands. What do you bring God in order to be saved? Sin. <laughs> it's all you can give God. All you can give God to be right with him is sin. That's all you and I have is sin. To be a Christian is to say, Jesus, take my sin, nail it into your body, and set me free from guilt and condemnation. And Jesus says, yes, I will, to every single person who asks him. Amen. August Top Lady, the hymn, famous hymn, Rock of Ages. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked flee to thee for dress, helpless fly to thee for grace. It's all bought by the hand of Jesus. 
And when we come empty-handed, he fills us with life, with forgiveness, with reconciliation. I learned a, a, a new song recently. Uh, it's a Red Mountain rewrite, hymn rewrite of an old hymn by a lady, an Irish hymn writer named Cecil Francis Humphreys Alexander. Anybody ever heard of her? <laughs> she wrote 400 hymns. One of them says this. When wounded sore, the stricken heart lies bleeding and unbound. One only hand, a pierced hand, can salve the sinner's wound. Lift up thy bleeding hand, O Lord, unseal that cleansing tide. We have no shelter from our sin but in thy wounded side. That's the end of point number one. What is the hand of the Lord? What's it mean? Why is it important? Do you get that? It stands for five aspects of God's work on the earth. His presence, his power, his provision, his, you know, there's peace. And one last thing, and uh, be done in five minutes. Is that about right? I said, don't preach too long your first sermon. You will not set a good precedent, Mike. <laughs> so th this is it's really very simple. What are the implications for us? It's very simple. I, I bet you can see it coming. There's a pattern for the church. God opens his hand. What do you th how do you think it's going to finish? We open ours. God opens his hand and fills us with his grace. What should you do, my beloved? You should receive it. You should relish it. You should rest in it. You should rejoice over that grace. You should remember it at the table. And you should return thanks to the open hand of God and Jesus by opening yours. What will make Calvary like Antioch? We've received the riches of the blessings of Jesus Christ, the open hand of God, and we have received them, and we have opened our hands where God wants us to open our hands to others. So where's that place in your life? Think about this, pray about this, talk about it in your small groups, fellowship with Christians, do this together, let's do it as a church. Where's that place in your life where God, having filled your hand, now wants you to open your hand to others so that you can share what with them? Some of you, it would just be time. Some of you have the gift of encouragement. Some of you love to pray and intercede. Some of you have money to give. Some of you have expertise. You have hospitality. You have two ears to listen. Ask Jesus to show you where in your life you're to be opening your hand. And you know what will happen to the church? The hand of the Lord will be upon it. And let me just state the obvious. The reason this is an important focus is if God's impulse is to open his hand, he's the guy at, at lunch who always says, give me the check, give me the check, give me the check, give me the check. God is impulsively generous. If his unending natural implication is to open his hand, ours is to do this. It's to close ours. We're naturally selfish. We love to take those blessings and just like hoard them for ourselves. But there is a power in this church. There's a power in your heart. There's a power in heaven. There's a power in Willow Grove that, 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 that rests selfishness out of people and moves them to open their hands. And it's the hand of Jesus that died for your sins. So think about that hand when you eat the bread today. And as we partake and we pray and we sing and we're encouraged and we look outside of ourselves. Where's the open hand? Where's my open hand to bless others? The hand of the Lord will be upon Calvary. Let me pray.